days, she made 1,001 transatlantic crossings. The ship is 181 feet tall and 1,019 feet long. The ship weighs 81,237 tons, including a 45-ton anchor. But like any ship that size, she's guided by a tiny rudder. And on that rudder is a tiny device, which I didn't know until I read this article. A tiny device, and it's called the trim tab. The trim tab is what turns the ship. Prayer is our trim tab that turns the heart towards God and off of ourselves. I hear too much from our federal leaders, America is great. We will rebuild. We will come back stronger. We will. We will. We will. We are America. This is who we are. This is all good, and I'm in it, and I believe it, but I also believe it's a secondary war cry. Our cry needs to be cry for repentance. Our cry needs to be to the God we need more now than ever. I'm reminded of a song that Carmen wrote. He's a Christian songwriter, Christian musician, singer, and it's called America Again. And I want to read to you just a couple of the uh, lyrics from the song because it is so powerful, and I know it's an older song, um, but I want to read to you this, and this really meant a lot to me. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Samuel Adams, First Justice, John Jay, synonymous with the spirit of our country, founding fathers of the USA. Over 2,000 years ago, they shook off the chains of tyranny from Great Britain by divine call. Citing 27 biblical violations, they wrote the Declaration of Independence with liberty and justice for all. But something happened since Jefferson called the Bible the cornerstone. For American liberty, then put it on our schools as a light, or since give me liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry said. Our country was founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We eliminated God from the equation of American life, thus eliminating this reason this nation first began. From beyond the grave, I hear the voices of founding fathers plead, we need God in America again. Of the 55th men, 55 men who wrote and formed the Constitution, 52 were active members of their church. Founding fathers like Noah Webster and who wrote the first dictionary could literally quote the Bible chapter and verse. James Madison said, we staked our future and our ability to follow the Ten Commandments with all of our heart. These men believe you couldn't even call yourself an American if you would submit the word of God. In his farewell address, Washington said, you can have national morality apart from religious principle. And it's true, because right now we have all these kids carrying around guns and calling them war zones. In the 40s and 50s, students were problems in school, were gums, chewing gum and talking. In the 90s, rape and murder are the trend. Only way this nation can even have its last decade is to put its hope in God again. Abraham Lincoln said this, The philosophy of the schoolroom is one generation, will be the philosophy of the government of the next. So when you eliminate the word of God from the classroom and politics, you eliminate the nation that word protects. And then finally, just the last thought I wanted to share with you about this. Is there ever been a time for the church to rise up? It is now. For the Christian men and women to proclaim God's love and proclaim that Jesus Christ is coming again. We need America. We need God in America again. Yeah, it was actually written in the 1990s. So I have no doubt at all for God's love for mankind as he has proved it. And you can look in your Bibles of John chapter 3, verse 16, which is probably one of the most remarkable, world-renowned verses that everyone is aware with. So during this time with the unwanted, we didn't expect it, an unwanted COVID-19 virus, we have witnessed and experienced a global economy being crippled crippling under unemployment the highest in U.S. history. People's emotions are clipping with fear, doubt, the unknown. We have a choice to look at the virus that can cripple our lives or it has given us an opportunity. I choose to look at this not to cripple our lives, but I look at this as an opportunity for the church and the men of the churches throughout our nation, but also throughout our world, to step up and to be men of God and to lead by example in a Christ-like manner. How can we do that? We can remember the words of Joshua in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a powerful message as well. And I had to learn this lesson in my life 
to lean not on my own understanding, to try to stop fixing people or stop trying to f- uh, rescue people. And when I came across these two verses of Scripture, it literally changed my life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. It's an important time to be able to uh, lean on God and to pray. Just recently, my wife and I watched a movie called Harriet. and It was about Harriet Tubman, an incredible African-American lady who was in slavery and how much that she was God-fearing and how much she loved people. And Harriet, God used Harriet uh, Tubman to eventually free over 700 fl- slaves from the South. Why? It's because Harriet was a prayer warrior. Harriet was courageous. She developed what I call the develop of listening and being in tune with God when he would talk with her. She would pray on every time she would go to back to the south to get more slaves to set them free, and every time she would bring them back to the north so they would be free. It was amazing in the movie you would see this lady of God to kneel down and to listen to God's voice with people behind her, the slaves behind her, wanting to go to freedom. But she was in tune with God, and God told her not to go left, but to go right. Because if she would have went left, there would have been danger. And this is throughout her life. And she was also an incredible lady of faith, which is a testimony to us today about being courageous. She was the first lady to ever lead a regiment of the North against the South uh, in the Civil War. So I believe that God is calling men to be godly, stable. He's calling us to be clear-minded and to be obedient. He's calling us to walk by faith and not by sight. Courage needs to replace fear. Faith needs to replace fear. Mental toughness needs to replace fear. Has there ever been a time, I want to ask you this question, and I thought about this question last night when I was preparing this. Has there ever been a time where someone blessed you with something that you did not deserve? The Bible story I want to share you with is about God's grace and mercy. The story that I want to share with you is about leadership, compassion, and wisdom. The story is found in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, and the key players are King David, Jonathan, and Mephibosheth. In our story, the king of Israel was named Saul. He was not a good king, but Saul's son was Jonathan, and Jonathan had a best friend named David. At the time of the story, David was a teenager, and David came across an opportunity where he able to face a giant on behalf of God and Israel against their number one enemy, the Philistines. As a teenager, he went out to face this trained killer. With a pouch full of stones and a slingshot, David took one stone, and that's all that was needed, and with complete accuracy, threw the, used a slingshot and went through the air and hit Goliath in the head and knocked him down. David proceeded to go over, then to chop off his head with Goliath's sword, and actually took his head back into the enemy's camp to remind them that God was the one in control. Now, King Saul, in our story in 2 Samuel, he absolutely hated David. Why? It's because he was jealous of him, because of all of Israel, cheered more for David because of killing Goliath more than the king. So Jonathan and David knew also in their friendship that God anointed David to be the next king of Israel because King Saul's days were numbered. Jonathan asked David to promise to him when he became king that he would take care of his crippled son. There was a battle, and Jonathan was in it, and he was killed. And his son at the time when Jonathan was killed was only five years old. King Saul died, and it was time for God's anointed one, David, to become the next king of Israel. But right when that happened, there was a nurse, a wonderful nurse, came and scooped up the five-year-old little boy, to take him out of the kingdom. Because in a time of history, if you're living in a time of history, any time a new king would come in, he would make sure that all the previous king's loyal subjects and the people in his court, uh, his family, were not well, they were going to be wiped out so they wouldn't come and take away the new king and, and take away his uh, power. So this nurse knew that she needed to save this little boy's life of only five years old And as she was fleeing for her life and for his life, she accidentally dropped this little boy. And by dropping this little boy, she crippled him for life. As he grew up, he couldn't work. He couldn't contribute in family or community. But David, King David, 
at the time, he remembered his promise to his best friend, Jonathan. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 says this, David asked people in his court, especially his main right guy, who was named Ziba, he asked this question, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? You see, we live in the time of history. The new king would have all this previous kings and families and everyone else wiped out. But this was not true of King David. And it's not true of our God because God doesn't give us what we deserve. So David asked a question to his right-hand man, Ziba, is there anyone left in the house of King Saul? Ziba knew about this little boy. He knew about where he lived in this poor, remote village. He knew about this boy being a cripple. He also knew he was Jonathan's son, but he did not want to tell the king because he felt that this little boy, he made his own judgment call and felt this little boy had nothing beneficial to offer to the king. He has nothing beneficial to offer to the community. And so Ziba, in his own opinion, in his own mind, uh, wrote him off. But David found out that this little boy existed. So he sent Ziba and his men, and he summoned this little boy to come to the palace. When the, little boy, when the boy was coming to the palace, he was thinking, you know what? This is probably the end of my life because we know what happens, what the king does to the former king that served. He gets rid of everybody. But I'm also here to tell you that in our lives, our God is the God of second chances. Could you imagine if you or I were there, we'd be waiting in anticipation for what the king's going to do when this crippled person comes right into his presence as the king is sitting on his throne. And so can you imagine he's walking in slowly but surely with crippled feet. And here King David, he sees him for the first time, probably thinks about his love and friendship for Jonathan. And this crippled person comes in. But here's David's response. Don't be afraid, David said to him. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore you to all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. This is what Jesus offers us as men. He accepts us. He loves us right where we're at. He doesn't ask you or me to go clean up our act, then come to him, because we can't do it. He doesn't say your past is so horrific So I'm not going to forgive you because you messed up big time. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, reminds us of this grace of God, reminds us of his love. It says, but God demonstrates his own for love us in this way. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you remember how Jesus died in between two thieves? One knew that he deserved to die for his crimes. But that same person, after admitting that, and said Jesus did nothing wrong, he's an innocent man. But this same thief knew who Jesus was, being the Son of God, and asked him to forgive him. And Jesus, he said, Jesus, will you please remember me in paradise? And it was right before he died. So this morning, as men, don't wait to come to Christ. The other thief was stubborn. He was rebellious. He had so much hatred in his heart. And he didn't believe Jesus was the Savior, and he unfortunately perished. I found myself in the story about King David, Jonathan, and his crippled son. Anytime that I read the Bible, it seems like the Bible reads me, because there's times I find myself looking in the mirror and in retrospect looking and saying, God, is there some things in me that I'm doing that's displeasing to you? I would ask my wife, is there some things that I'm saying or doing or my attitude, my tone, my body language that I'm doing to displease you because I want to change. I want to continue to grow. I want to be more Christ-like. Now, here's the insight I found in this story. You and I are the broken beggar. We are not the king over our lives. A lot of times men, this is important for us to know because a lot of times men want to be in charge of their own destiny. We want to be in control We want to be able to do what we want to do. We have an attitude, this is my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. But listen, in this story, in our lives, the truth is this. Before we know God, before we have a relationship with Christ, we are the broken, crippled beggar. We are not the king over our lives. So before coming to Christ, we didn't deserve his love. We didn't deserve his forgiveness. We didn't deserve his mercy and grace. We all have a messed up past. 
so many regrets. We love to be able to take the remote that we use a lot in our homes, especially being quarantined, watching television. We should, we'd love to take the remote and hit the rewind button and go back five years ago, ten years ago, to a situation that we regret, to a person we should, did something to or said something to, or something we should have done, but we, became, we remained quiet or we remained just isolated away from what we should do. But we're unable to go back to the past, and we can't live in the past. But I'm here to tell you because of God's grace and Jesus' blood that he shed on the cross, you and I are forgiven for our past. So please do not allow your past to dictate your future. Now, in closing, I want to leave you with three insights that I really grabbed from this story of, in 2 Samuel. The first insight is this. Grace is offered to the lost. When David asks, is there anyone else in Saul's family for me to show kindness to, the messenger, Ziba, made his own call and saying, this boy is not going to do anything for the king. He's, he's not any good. He doesn't anything to um, participate in. And so, but David saw this opportunity to be a man of integrity in his leadership. He remembered his promise to Jonathan, and he was going to follow through on this promise. And this promise is because of what David did. It's called grace. When we are given something, or forgiven of something that we don't deserve to have. The second insight that I have is God's grace turns our enemies into friends. David invited this boy, this crippled boy, into his palace to specifically sit at his table. Not only sit at his table, but he gave him all the lands that belonged to King Saul, who was a wealthy man. So he has the financial blessing, but bigger than the financial blessing, he has the personal, intimate relationship now with the king and everyone sitting at the table with the king, which means a lot more to this boy. Sitting at the table with the king is a privilege because it's all about a personal relationship. It's all about intimacy, where you develop intimacy with those who are seated at that table with you. Now can you imagine it's time for dinner? And the butler goes, and he goes to this young boy's room, and he says to him, it's time for dinner. It's time for you to come to the king's table and to eat. Everyone is seated at the table, or seated at the table. But who comes last and takes the longest to get there but this little crippled boy? Because he's walking so slow, and he's hobbling in. Everyone's seated at the table, and can you imagine at this beautiful, majestic table with all the food and drink that you could ever want. And all of a sudden, all eyes turn to this little boy. They're all covered. And so all of a sudden, this little boy finally gets to a seat, and he sits down with his handicap. But when he sits down, I want you to know, when he sits down, the napkin that is put over him by the butler, the tablecloth that is put over him, hides and shelters his crippled legs which shows to me that he is equal. He is equal at the king's table. And that's what it is at the cross of Jesus Christ. We are all equal in God's eyes. God is not the God of favoritism. And so by the bloodshed of Jesus, he covers our crippleness. He covers our sins. He covers our shame. He covers our guilt. And because of that, and and as this little boy sat at this table, No one even thought of his crippleness because he was the same level as all the rest of David's family and all of David's trusted friends. And we are the same under Jesus Christ. So this morning, join me as we ask God for forgiveness, as we repent as a nation, as we repent in our lives. Join me as we say goodbye to guilt. Say goodbye to shame. Say goodbye to all your regrets. Say goodbye to all your past. And come to the table with your brokenness and give your life to Christ. The exciting thing is this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, meaning a relationship, not a denomination, not a religion. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, but the new is here. So don't get bogged down with joining a denomination or feel you have to be super religious. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. His grace is available for you. So this morning as you hobble to his table, he will take care of your crippleness and you'll never have any more regrets. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson and challenge. 
that as Christian men and how we need to lead our spouses, we need to lead our children, we need to lead our community. We need to love others and treat others on how we want to be treated. But you're also reminded us, God, to love the Lord your God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and spirit. And God, I can't imagine if our whole world would just take their eyes off of themselves, take their eyes off of this virus, take their eyes off of their own crisis right now, and to put all of our eyes as God's created mankind and put our eyes heavenward. To see our Heavenly Father seated upon the throne and to look and see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father and that we know without a shadow of a doubt with all of our faith that God is in control, that God has our back, and that God wants us to replace fear with faith. So this morning, go with God. Join me as we all step up as Christian men to take the lead. Have a blessed day.